So welcome again. Um, so just a little bit about the Chicago Public Library Maker Lab. It is Chicago's first free and publicly accessible makerspace on the third floor of Harold Washington Library Center. Uh, they feature introductory workshops and open shop for personal projects and collaboration. They are equipped with all kinds of equipment, which we won't see, or which we will see is what I meant to say. So I won't get into that because we'll see it. Um, Mark Anderson is here with us. He's the Director of Learning and Economic Advancement. Um, he is responsible for developing system-wide programs for workforce development, small business, adult learning, and the CPL Maker Lab. He's been at CPL for over 20 years in various positions and worked previously at a range of college and public libraries. I will read that much and you can tell us more about you. <laughs> and we also have Sasha here with us, Sasha Neary. And as a CPL librarian, Sasha works in the Maker Lab and the Adult Services Department. She's 20 years of public service experience, particularly focused on informal instruction, design and makerspaces, community outreach and user, reach, user research in a design thinking context. Uh, and she was part of the CPL team that produced design thinking for libraries. Uh, so, which you can find more about online. And I'm sure Sasha can speak to it more than I can. So with that, if you guys want to start doing the tour, um, and as I said, if folks have questions, please put them in the chat box in the meantime. Um, and Amy will be on the call in a little bit and together we moderate. So, and hopefully, like I said, at the end, we'll have time for Q and A. These typically don't last more than an hour. So it's a little loud right now because we're in the hallway. We wanted to show you the exterior first. It'll get quieter once we go in. Um, so I'm going to pull you back a little bit. So you get the whole experience of entering the lab. So on the left, we have a nice week at a glance to help people who are just, you know, walking by. Um, we're not open in the morning most days of the week. So there's no one here to tell them what's happening. Uh, so this gives them a little insight to what's going on. Um, it's changed a little bit over the years. And to the right of the door, we've got um, to let people know that who they can talk to. Sometimes the lab is very crowded, so um, they can view a picture of the staff member and then come in and ask questions. Uh, we also have a postcard holder up on the right in case they want to take something with them. Um, these were all developed over the course of five years. We did not start out with them on day one. And then this is our little trophy case. So we've got a little uh, red T-Rex, which is a very difficult 3D print. We don't suggest people start with it. You have to assemble it. Uh, we won the Chicago Innovation Award for Social Innovator in 2013, so we very proudly display that. Um, but we probably could change it up because it's been a few years. I think we just resurfaced the key to it or something. All right, so now we're gonna go in. We also have these lovely glass doors so that people can kind of see what's happening inside and frequently when a workshop has already begun, um, people will stop outside and take pictures or kind of watch what's going on for a little bit. All right. Hopefully you've noticed the sound level has improved. <laughs> so um, welcome, this is our, our CPL Maker Lab and we have been around since July 2013. Um, we started out as a, with a grant from, the, from IMLS, the Institute of Museum and Library Services, to set up um, a maker space in a public library and then um, kind of explore that and try that out. Um, we do have, uh, I'm sure Erica can give us a link to our report of our first six months, which is on our website, Making to Learn, um, which captures a lot of our, our learnings and then we can re tell you some other things as well. But we started out as just a six month project um, six month pilot and our initial goal, we were the innovation lab and every six months we we're gonna do something different. However, this was our first idea, our first plan and it just took off like wildfire. And after six months, it was universally um, felt by staff as well as the public that the space couldn't close. There was still so much we could do. 
And in reality, it took us, the staff, about six months to really start feeling comfortable and you know going a little beyond what we were basically doing some little little basic things. Um, one of our our goals at the beginning was not to be a production lab. So we are not a place where you can print 500 of something or 50 of something. Um, we're part of the library. Um, we felt that the library has always been a place to get information through books and programs and databases. Um, but this was a way to extend it to experiential learning, to learning by doing and um, also, we wanted to provide access to some of this technology, which is kind of our hook. You know, people are really interested in getting access or learning about 3D printing, laser cutting. Um, but we are really interested in people learning these additional computer literacy skills, these higher level ones. And where else do people in the public have access to learning these things or experiencing them? If you're in a, a university or in a, a workplace that has access to these, you, you have that opportunity. But the regular um, public library patron or regular citizen, how do you get access other than through private organizations where you pay a membership? So again, we wanted to eliminate all barriers of entry. Um, we also decided, um, Sasha was on a committee at the very beginning of this project, who looked at spaces around Chicago and they were interested in the hacker and the maker spaces and they realized that they were all a little advanced. There was no sort of entry point. So they um, formulated this concept really early that we, the public library could be the on-ramp to making, to learning some of the basics, the vocabulary, some of the skills, but also to the other organizations in Chicago um, we're, Chicago is a huge city with many interests and organizations and opportunities, but it's kind of hard to break into some of those. So our idea was to be the entree. You know, we give people referrals all the time for workforce, um, for jobs, housing. You know, so this is still in our, our wheelhouse to give people um, referrals to other maker organizations. Um, so. It's kind of sort of our, our background, our philosophical grounding. So I'll go over some of the machines that we do have available real quick. Um, so we have a pair of laser cutters, um, which are extremely popular. Um, when we opened five years ago, our staff didn't know very much about them. Um, you know, it's just a 40 watt laser, so we get a lot of questions on whether or not they cut metal or um, leather and all kinds of materials that are a little trickier. Um, we've had to make samples over time to help people kind of figure out like, okay, if you design X, it's going to look something like this, or if you design this way, it's going to look, you know, a different way, so rastering and engraving. Um, I personally love this machine. Uh, they're expensive, but they're much faster to design. Um, obviously, different machines have different benefits, um, which you probably have experience with. Um, but this is the one that we, um, so all of our machines have a two hour time limit in the lab. This one especially is easily the one that is booked all, all day during open shop. So um, we have three open shops during the week um, from 10 to one on Friday and Saturday, and then from one to eight on Wednesday. So on Wednesdays, when we open at one in the afternoon, we'll have people kind of waiting outside to come in. <laughs> Their files are ready. Um, and they're, they're pretty generous and thoughtful with each other at least. So they kind of know like, okay, I know that person's gonna be on for two hours. Um, so I'll come back in an hour, put my name in the queue, you know, if they're not back when that person's done, they lose their place, but um, they, they tend to be uh, very peacefully negotiated, which is great. Um, we have two of these lasers, so we have one on the other end. Um, we don't have, ex we don't have an exterior wall, so we do have to use an air filter, which is about as expensive as the laser, unfortunately. Um, 
but it, it's it's made all the difference in here. Um, it's very popular. And this is one of our, our more expensive machines. You know, I think in the course of five years, 3D printers have like dropped in cost as well as in, um, you know, accessible for people. The laser cutter has not. This is still extremely expensive and one that you probably wouldn't have in your home. So that's a really big draw. And I think just jumping back, one of the things we also do in the lab is we offer like 10 workshops a week and their um, instruction. These are located on our uh, Maker Lab Wiki, all of our instruction, which we can give you the link to later. Those are all designed by staff in here. And, you know, to utilize one of the machines. We also early on decided that we didn't want to be a tech geek spot. We wanted to be more about making and creativity in general, including the technology. So we also do some analog making in here, which can be anything from flower arranging to Arduino to origami. Um, part of that was um, an idea to get more people into the lab so that they could feel comfortable in here if the technology was kind of a little too, um, maybe too advanced or too off-putting, trying to get people in the space doing some of these creative um, tasks that were more interesting, were more uh, accessible in their mind. But then showing them that the Maker Lab was something that was accessible to them. This is why it's really great doing a presentation with a partner because you're like, oh yeah, I should have mentioned that too. So thank you. <laughs> um, so the workshops are a lot of fun. They are taught from a very introduction level. Um, we don't assume you know anything except um, hopefully you're comfortable with the keyboard and the mouse. Um, but even some people seem to not use a mouse very much. So that can be very interesting with uh, 3D modeling. So we have um, about 35 minutes dedicated to some design time. Um, we do kind of, you know, assign a project. So it might be keychains one day or a phone stand another day. Um, but that's really to get people experienced with the workflow. Uh, we do very much encourage them to come back during open shop to really explore some of the possibilities. And our, our open shop is, you know, a couple times during the week just to allow people to come in who have already taken one of our classes to experiment and sort of create something on their own. Um, it's great to have a space where you can learn and have classes, but I think it's equally um, useful to have a spot where you can experiment and where staff is on hand to help you. Um, during our open shop, we don't recommend that people come in who have no experience, haven't taken a class. Um, well, we, you know, if they do, we kind of direct them to another time. Also, when people come in and don't know how to use a mouse or a keyboard, which happens, we have other services in the library that we can direct them to and once they get those skills, we invite them back. So again, it's not a, we try not to turn people away totally, but to give them an opportunity to come back. Yeah, we have a lot of practice with um, having staff not control the mouse too much when we're helping someone who needs more detailed help. Or, you know, if you, if it gets to the point where you have to demonstrate the thing, you demonstrate the steps and then you undo that, go back a few steps and then let the patron, um, do it themselves. Um, so you'll also probably have noticed we do have this great whiteboard paint and all of this knowledge externalized for us. Um, you know, if you are only working one day a week in the lab, as some of our staff are, you are going to forget which settings to use for acrylic versus cherry or, well, actually those are pretty similar, but still. <laughs> You need the assist. So we have a lot of different things externalized on the walls for us so that, you know, we're not kind of pulling a binder out or, you know, yelling across the room, hey, I don't remember this. Can you come help me? Um, and it's also really helpful for the patrons, too, um, especially when they come during open shop. We'll ask them to record their settings so that when they come back, you know, they're kind of managing their own process. While they don't run the machines, 
um, you know, they are part of the like, well, I want to experiment with this, or can we, you know, I want this to be a little bit darker or what have you. Um, so we have a lot of different reminders on the wall, um, especially by the laser cutter. And what's really um, been great in our space is following that whole maker philosophy externally to our, our patrons and public, but also internally to our staff. So they get creative on the wall as well. And as you go through, you'll see that all of our machines are named. They aren't numbers. Um, and it's, it's really, you know, random. Harold, of course, our laser cutters, named Harold Washington Library, but you can see some of them, like the next one is a little more irreverent. Yeah. So Mo, you know. Uh, we started with the Three Stooges for the 3D printers because we were having a very tough time with them at first. Um, but then as we started to replace machines and, um, and switch some out, we realized we didn't have enough um, women machines <laughs> in the uh, lab. So we've got Emily and Laura also. Um, and, and Laura was formerly Larry of the Three Stooges, but we sort of retrofitted yeah, we, very 2018. We want to struggle with that too here at Boise State, just so you all know. <laughs> That's awesome. So we have four operational MakerBot replicator twos, which we do still like quite a bit. I mean, they are you know four to five years old, um, but we are starting to you know add different printers and kind of experiment with those. Um, you know, we've had some staff members, you know, purchase their own machines and so they can give us a little bit of feedback on what we may want to purchase next. Um, that's also really helpful when patrons come in and um, they might start needing to print for hours and hours at a time. We've had a few people, you know, end up buying their own printers. Um, and so then they come back to laser cut and they're like, oh, you haven't seen me because I've been printing at home, but now I need to use a laser cutter, which I'm not going to buy, um, which makes perfect sense. Oh, and then you may have also noticed our workstation. So our little bright blue screens here. Um, we just recently reconfigured our space uh, just a little bit. These workstations were against the wall. Um, which worked fine. I mean, they were facing our big screen, um, but we had some staff kind of grumble about the walkways. When it's open shop, it fills up quite a bit in here. And so, you know, it gets a little crowded. Um, and I wouldn't say that this is much less crowded because our space is, you know, we can't change the size of it. But um, the clusters are a little more um, fun to work in. So maybe this will help you. It's kind of a U shape now, um, as opposed to just the little rows. Yeah, two U shape. Yeah. So. And, and I think that's probably, at this point, one of the aspects of um, having a makerspace and an established university or library is you have to take the space you're given. <laughs> you know, we're not at the, the point where a new building is being made and we can kind of do it from scratch. Um, so this is the room we're given and, you know, we worked with not having an outside wall by having a filter for the laser cutter. And we've really made the best use of the space that we can, but we still, um, we still get to tinker with it. So again, still that whole tinkering mentality. Yeah, and it, it kind of really changed the feel and it just felt refreshed for the staff. So I think they liked that quite a bit. Um, back to a couple of the machines, um, we've got, we just recently changed from the Silhouette um, Cameo to the Cricut Maker. Um, it's been an interesting experience. I kind of liken this little machine to Alexis, which I also add I've never actually been in, but <laughs> It kind of just opens very smoothly. Um, the, you don't have to adjust the blades, which I really like. Um, my grumble, though, is it's the software is cloud-based, and I find that you know kind of not user-friendly if you're not online or if you have an internet outage. Um, but that's kind of you know that's where things are going. So 
there's not much I can do about that. Uh, and then, so we have two of the Cricut makers. Um, we also have purchased those for one of our satellite locations that we're just getting started with. Um, and then the one machine that we only have one of is um, the Carvey from Invincibles. So it is a desktop mill, um, also cloud-based software, Easel, which is free to have an account. Work area is about eight by 11 inches, maybe two and a half inches deep. Um, there is this mystery material that I don't remember what it's called. <laughs> it looks like a white stone. Starts with the letter C, and someone's been experimenting with it. It's really nice. Um, you can make, it's like, a, it takes heat well. So you could put something really hot on it, it would be fine. Um, but this machine is, it's fun to work with. Um, it is a little scary though. Like <laughs> the first week we had it, I'm pretty sure I broke um, a bit, which happens pretty frequently. So once you've done it the first time, you're good after that. It's going to happen and you know, it's, it's not you probably, um, but it's, it's a lot of fun to use. Um, we did actually work with Inventables uh, a little bit on this machine because they previously made available um, their Shapeoko machines, which um, don't have a body, and so they're a little bit harder to work in spaces like a library or school, and they were really interested in being able to do that. So they got quite a bit of feedback from us because um, they are a local Chicago company. Um, so I got to go and do kind of the user unboxing for this, and. Um, that was fun because you're kind of like vocalizing everything that you're doing and the questions that you have. Um, it is also a very heavy machine, so I did not lift it at any point. And, you know, based on our, our relationship with Inventables and their assistant and our assistant, um, they did donate this machine to us. So we're very lucky in that aspect. So we're almost at the front of the room now, and you can see our great, wonderful, giant screen up here. Um, this is one of the features that we inherited with this space. Um, this space was an exhibit area, so there was often a video playing on this wall. Um, there were cases on either side um, with like artifacts of, of various special collections. Um, and then seating in this room, um, it was a good place to hide, I have heard, so. It was, it was really underutilized and kind of a sleepy space, so um, this has really enlivened it. And um, you probably couldn't tell when we first entered the room, but we're just off the main escalator. So we had incredible um, foot traffic going by and visibility, which really helped. Um, there were also no doors in the space. So when the space was being um, reimagined, you know, the glass doors were a vital part of it so that people could see in. Um, even if there was a class going on, they could still see activity in here and um, hopefully become intrigued and come back later. Which they definitely do. So I'll turn that just so it's not like blinding us in the back anymore. Um, and then we'll have the room view again. Uh, so let's see, a couple other things we didn't cover. Oh, we just recently added some sewing machines, so we need to get more of our staff on board um, for how to use those because I have never used a sewing machine before. Um, although one of our staff, uh, he brought in some different things to mend yesterday and he was mending during open shop, which was great. Um, let's see, we have... Also on our wall, some other externalized knowledge that we use during our introduction. So for the workshop, it roughly looks like a 10 minute introduction where we explain how the space came to be. Um, we give a huge nod to IMLS and encourage people to, you know, if you hear their name in the news, be interested in what's happening around that because something might be interesting. Um, and then we kind of talk about some of the other maker spaces. So as Mark mentioned earlier, there are, we're very fortunate. Um, we have so many different creative spaces in Chicago, um, but they do have different membership levels, access and tiers. Um, but we want to make sure that people do know about them in case, you know, they are a good fit for those other spaces. So we'll mention one or two usually, 
And we really like to talk about Free Geek Chicago. So Free Geek is in a couple of other cities and you know, you volunteer some time, you earn credit for the store um, for a refurbished computer. And the way you volunteer is by disassembling computers. Um, so it's a really nice little circular system. Um, and so that's the one we usually talk about that in Pumping Station One. And we'll tell people if you have questions about other services or other types of spaces, let us know afterwards. Um, and then we have about 35 minutes of instruction and then we can have up to 45 minutes or an hour for fabrication, during which time people chat, um, you know, they learn about each other and they fill out a survey for us, which helps us figure out who's visiting the lab or at least, you know, quantify that. And that's one of the, the advantages of having, you know, our classes are rather small, probably eight to 10 is probably the max. But while they're waiting for their items to print or be fabricated, they fill out the survey. Um, I'm sure all of us have done classes where you distribute the survey or you ask them to do the survey and everybody just wants to get out. Um, mm -hmm. This way, they have to wait for their object to be created or printed. So they're more willing to do the question, the survey. And those have been really important for us as we try to figure out what additional services, what's working well, what we can improve. Definitely. Um, I think I lost my train of thought. Surveys, workshops, oh yeah. So all of our workshops are free. We're also very lucky to be able to do that. Um, as Mark mentioned earlier, we do have some outside presenters come in. So they may be local artists or other makers and they come in and share you know, whatever it is they do. Um, those are also free, uh, and we offer free private workshops to anyone who has a group of four to eight people, um, which is a really nice thing to, to kind of leverage during outreach, like, hey, you know, we have this great space that you might want to use, you and your friends, or, you know, you and your fellow teachers, or whomever. Um, and we, we try to get those on the schedule as well. And we do that for a number of reasons. One, um, we have special groups like a group of you know, public school teachers wanting to come in and do some. We've had um, local organizations like ad agencies want like a creative team building activity. So they've come in. Um, but we also, um, we do that so if you have a group of five, you don't take up space in a public class and you know, um, disengage people who are gonna be coming in. Um, that way they fill up the class. So, um, so that was kind of self-serving on our end, but also being able to provide a, a special service by letting someone know that they can have just a group of class with their group, a gardening club, a science club, a club, any of those. Yeah, and that really helped us as we changed our registration model. Um, the, for the first year we, really needed to do registration because classes would fill up. Um, so we used Eventbrite at the time because our website didn't allow for that feature. Um, our website does do that now, but um, we did hit a point where, you know, as you may be familiar with, someone signs up for a free library class and then they are a no-show. Um, so we no longer do the advanced registration for these workshops. Um, you show up 15 minutes before it starts, we'll take your name, and then you're in pretty much. Um, we do, of course, keep attendance records, which includes like if you had to turn people away because there were too many people, um, so that we can, you know, if there is a trend, you know, we can try to think of something to, to fix that for people. Um, yeah, so our classes are usually, you know, four to eight, um, sometimes 12 if it's a hands-on craft workshop. Um, the space, it, we may not have specifically said this, but it really is targeted to adults. Um, we do want to make sure adults have the space to, to do fun stuff. Um, children and teens uh, usually get all the fun library programs, and that is especially true here at Harold Washington also. We have a, an amazing new media department on the first floor that does, you know, stuff for high school kids. And then we have a recently renovated children's museum or children's library on the second floor um, that's doing a lot of fun stuff too. 
Um, but to accommodate families, we do also have a family drop in day one Saturday a month so that um, they can bring in younger kids and work on a quick project so that, um, you know, they're, they get to participate as well. Are there any, um, so while you're on the topic, are there any age restrictions in general in order to access the space or just open to everyone who can come to the library? Yeah, so our, our age criteria is, you know, 14 and up, you're in, you can come in and participate in a class. And that's the, the public library, Chicago Public Library's definition of an adult. Mm -hmm. 14 and older, so we went in line with that. But also, but also if you're uh, between 10 and 13, you should be here with a parent or guardian. Um, and that's fine, you know, one of you can participate. Right, and as long as you have, they have the digital skills, you know, if they're able to use a mouse and be which most kids in that age can. Yeah, um, and then if you're under 10, then we kind of encourage you to come back during that family drop-in day. So I've had a mom with baby on her shoulder make the keychain for baby because baby couldn't do much yet. <laughs> but um, that's how we accommodate our younger crowd. Um, let's is it okay if I jump in and ask a couple questions? Please do. <laughs> so I hope I didn't miss this, but I'm looking behind you and I see that it says house rules. And I'm curious if you could tell us a couple of the rules that you have and also how you generated, I would imagine, because you all, because you've described your philosophy that you may have generated these rules together with the people who use the space. I don't know. I'm just guessing. Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Well, we didn't have the rules when we first opened. Um, not that we didn't have library rules, but we didn't have specific rules in here. And I think they kind of more evolved from the staff in here. I could be wrong, um, but just, you know, situations that kept coming up. So, um, I don't know if we can, you know, um, only using one machine at a time, when we first opened, we were very underutilized. So we probably set the bad precedent by letting some people do two machines. But then as we became more um, regularly used, that was not something that we could continue to do. Um, we also, as I mentioned before, we didn't want to be a production lab. You know, we're the library, we're trying to, um, you know, lifelong learning, learning how to do things. So we do ask that people stay with their job um, and watch it print or be created. Um, Which isn't to say you have to stare at it while it's <laughs> happening, but you are in the lab uh, and we've seen some really fun conversations strike up between people who are waiting for their um, objects to be made. And, you know, and it's funny because originally the rules were handwritten but then we use the um, Cricut to kind of late to print the letters. But I think, um, I don't know if you can see number nine. Um, uh, Not too well, but <laughs> it, <it's laughs> you can read have, it, it'd be great. It's have fun and make great stuff. So, you know, we didn't want them to be, you know, discouraging the people. Yeah. Um, we also, uh, number seven is, that Maker Lab staff are the ones who handle the machines. Um, so I know it makes sense in other spaces, like an actual hacker space or maybe a university to certify people so that they're the only people running the machines. Um, we did not at the time have a good system of like all the things people need to know and making sure they could do it. So we are very fortunate we have um, probably six to eight full-time librarians, one who is in the lab at all times, and the others um, work at our branch location, and they're here one day a week. So we do have a staffing model that allows us to, to be the, the handlers of the machine. Intermediary, um, yeah. yeah. We do try to, to inform patrons of all of the things that are happening, you know, like this is the extruder that gets to this temperature, there's a gear, you know, making sure that they have an understanding of the process. 
um, but we don't let them take apart the 3D printers or anything like that. So, and, and that was, uh, at the very beginning, some of the other models we looked at had users being certified. And as, as a library, one, we weren't sure how to keep those records or keep them safe. You know, if it were a paper file, do we have to go in there every time and certify, you know, and um, confirm that someone's certified? And then just how do we keep those records safe with any of that personal information? Um, so we decided to go with the, the staff model where the staff is the intermediary between the patron and the machine. Yeah, and then a couple of the other house rules, um, you know, we try to not start things 30 minutes before close because then you, <laughs> then you're not closing on time. Um, and, and we are fortunate too that we, um, the Maker Lab closes to the public an hour before the library closes. So that gives us time for those run over projects. And it also gives us time to you know, clean up, try to fix something that's broken, maybe get set up for the next day. Yeah. And then um, number six is we are reviewing all of the jobs. Part of that is just for the time estimate. Is this a five hour job? Because five hour jobs are not allowed. Um, or, you know, is this actually something that looks like a weapon, um, which does not happen nearly as much as people, you know, kind of predicted it would. Um, so we're also grateful for that, but we do review everything. Um, and also for design issues, um, the laser cutter and the vinyl cutter can be a little tricky if you've never, you know, if you're used to designing web graphics and not things that need to be cut by a machine. So that is usually very instructive for the patron. And, and our um, job limit is two hours. That's to you know, ensure that other people have access to the machines. If your job is longer than two hours, the team in here works with you either to maybe make it in two parts or maybe to scale it down so you can you know, get a, an image of it. Um, yeah, and then we also have a little events around town. So we're trying to promote some of the things, you know, our friends or partners are doing that we think will be of interest to an audience that is going to come and hang out in the Maker Lab. Yeah, thank you. More questions is great. Yeah, I have a question. Um, how do you all keep track of, I mean, I know I, I struggle with it here in Boise because we've been growing so much, but you're in Chicago. How do you all keep a network of the existing maker spaces that exist around town? And do you all have like a group? Do you all meet up periodically? Like, can you talk a little bit about how you all stay in contact with each other? And then if you are the expert, I imagine it looks like if there's one person, how do you educate everybody else? Oh yeah, that space does this now too. They have a laser cutter now too. So our, our, our team is made of, up of the librarians and the uh, Maker Lab specialists, and the specialists are also incredibly invested in the Maker ecosystem. Um, so they like to check things out and they'll kind of tell us if there are new happenings. Um, and our, our specialists are 10 hour a week um staff that come in here and they're based on you know their like skills and abilities and um we are lucky because we are um the maker lab is funded by our chicago public library foundation once our imls grant ended we had another grant and now our foundation um supplements uh, the lab with the cost of materials our presenters and also we have seven part-time staff in here over 10 hours a week who really um, come from different angles than library staff. So, you know, artists and some are tinkerers. So through them, we're able to get some additional um, input. However, Sasha is also really involved with the maker community here and it's really um, big and growing. And there's a lot of informal um, communication. We also, through the Maker Lab, we invite some of those organizations in to do programs. So we do learn that. And also our team goes out on field trips to those locations to check them out. Yeah, and then we have um, <laughs> twice a year, we've been doing for several years, um, you know, what we call a maker summit. So 
Um, you know, I send out about, I don't know, like a hundred, over a hundred emails to various people at different groups. And sometimes I get a bounce back because they moved on and, you know, I'll take off their email or try to get their new one. Um, but most people are really invested. So a lot of, the, a lot of our contacts have stayed the same. Um, so, you know, we have friends at the Polsky Center at the University of Chicago, um, at Pumping Station One that we're in communication with. Um, we do have a Slack group that doesn't get used as much as I would like, but I know everyone is incredibly busy, especially because those places are more, some of them are more of a labor of love than, you know, that's not their day job, right? That's what they do after work. And so they're spread pretty thin too. Um, we just had one of the maker summits just like two weeks ago, and we had about 25 to 30 people. Um, it's kind of, it is a little informal. However, we, you know, asked three people to do presentation. One person had just gone to the Nation of Makers conference. So there is some of that reporting back. Um, we started to do this because, you know, we've done all this research and there were all these organizations. And I think some of them were working in isolation, especially five years ago. Um, and we felt, and we did learn that the library is sort of this, this neutral location because some of the, the spots are nonprofit, some are for profit and could be competitors in a certain way. I however, see. however yes. the library is sort of that neutral ground for everyone. So for us being the conveners, there's no um, yeah, detriment there. Yeah. And like other, you know, there are a couple other cities that are referred to this way, but as a city of neighborhoods, um, a little bit of duplication or replication is more than welcome. I mean, you know, if you're on the southwest side, you're probably not going to the northwest side that often. It, it will take you 40 minutes driving um, and you could have made something in that time. So, um, you know, as more spaces come online, um, it's just more opportunity to collaborate and, and serve other communities. We have a, a question from the chat. They said, it's Jacqueline. She said, I know that you held a tour for the ISTE conference attendees. Do you offer tours for other librarians? How do we get on the list for the Maker Summit? So we offer tours all the time. And I went to ISTE this year. It was my very first one. And it was it was overwhelming. It was amazing. You know, I went to ALA last year and I was like, okay, you know, I kind of get this. And then ISTE was just like, whoa, where is everything? Um, but yeah, we did offer a tour. I was so glad that someone reached out because I didn't think to reach out to anyone. Um, but yeah, we offer tours all the time. So we have a main email address, which is just makerspace at shy Publib, and we'll be happy to add that somewhere. Um, I answer that email um, and we'll schedule those. Um, tours are pretty easy for us to do. Um, the space accommodates up to 34 people. It's when people are requesting workshops that we have to kind of make it a smaller number. Um, but yeah, so yes, we love doing that. Um, and to get on the list for the summit, um, you can just send me an email or again, you can email that Makerspace account and I'd be happy to add you to the list. Um, you know, DePaul has a couple new spaces. Um, a couple other spaces have, you know, just been opening up so we, actually had a staff training this week and our staff got to walk a block and a half away and see um, DePaul's idea, idea Realization Lab, um, which was really nice because they were just immediately envious of this large open space. But like that's some of the stuff we do and I would be happy to connect anyone, you know, if you didn't know that they had that so close to the library because that's a really full day of um, touring awesome spaces. I really like your Tinkercad cat, by the way. <laughs> we have a lot of puns in our space also, and it seems like it, it just comes with the maker culture. Um, do you all have passion projects that you all work on that makes you makers yourselves in your own free time that like maybe predisposes you to be better at your job? I'm just curious, like what are your passion projects? 
Um, so I have been working on a web page for over a year now. <laughs> so I taught myself HTML and CSS after high school. Um, and I really enjoyed it, but I knew I wasn't going to be like a web designer. Um, so I recently have re-picked it up and like, I was super excited about CSS grid because it's fabulous, but I also have like a little bit of a learning curve. So that's one of my passion projects right now. Um, but also making my own websites encouraged me to take pictures. Um, so I actually have like a flicker of, I don't know, like a couple thousand pictures that I just, I love. So I'll go to like the Garfield Park Conservatory and take pictures of plants for hours. Um, so those are some of the things that I really like to do. And you know, I think mine are more, um, you know, my passion is gardening. So I am like creating spaces and also composting. So that's kind of like deconstructing of it and coming back, that whole circular thing. So that's really, really my like big passion outside here. Um, but what I, what I love about this space is that it's this, um, it fits totally in with the whole library philosophy and foundation. You know, it's not just wedged in to kind of make it fit. I think it's a natural evolution and um, addition to other things we do, other ways of learning and imparting information. Um, so that, I think that's kind of what keeps me going. Thanks for that. Can I interject a quick compost story? There's a high school in our town that um, over, they have a huge greenhouse program and then they have a ton of worm composting bins and every summer they ask people to take the compost home and so different families take them home and get to babysit the worms over the summer. And I did the best job of bringing my compost back out of everybody that like the, per the person was like crying. Um, so this year <laughs> I designed an award for the person who's the second best at worm composting and I'm going to 3D print multiple copies. For the so I'm 3D printing the best composting awards and it's literally like a worm on a plaque and it's ridiculous. And um, I just wanted to share my maker gardening intersection with you. <laughs> I think one of the things that's been so interesting in this space is that we've had, you know, people come in for a variety of reasons. Some are just curious. There are some that just want to see it, don't want to do it. They just want to see um, because there aren't places to have that sort of um, interaction or experience. But we've had people come in and use our, our cricket to make the numbers for their address. Very, very, you know, basic, but it's like, hey, this is my need. Um, we've had other people come in. We had a, um, a staff member who had hurt his, his fingers and had to hold them in a certain way and he created his own um, device, which I'll show you in a second. The shenanigans happening here. Yeah. Man. Um, so there's this whole wide variety of um, of uses, and you know, this is the the little device our colleague created, and what it did was it would hold. However, he had sprained his finger, it would hold it in a certain way so he didn't have to wear some like huge contraption. But he prototyped this. I think this was before he was even a staff member. Um, so it's just that having this specific problem that, you know, could you commercially make millions of these? Probably not. But that's what he needed at that moment. So I think the whole, the whole spectrum of um, creativity. We have other people who are making jewelry to sell on Etsy. Um, so it's just, you know, a, such a cross section of people. That is so cool. Are there other questions from anyone that's joining us today? Does anyone want to unmute and ask a question? There's been um, just a couple chats my questions. I'm curious because I have uh, virtually met with the folks at the Chicago Art Institute and that building is essentially like one giant labyrinthian makerspace. Um, just curious if you all work with them at all. Um, actually that is 
I completely forgot to mention this. Um, so we have a little offshoot of the Maker Lab. Um, we have a Makers on 8 program. Um, so 8 is just our 8th floor. It's our visual and performing arts collection. Um, they have a lot of great stuff and amazing staff. Um, and we have a weekly program that um, some of the School of the Art Institute students come out to do. Um, and that's been incredibly popular. Like they actually, they have to use the online registration for that um, just to make sure there's enough uh, supplies for people. So that's one way we've worked with them. Um, and then the various instructors we get from the creative community, some of them are from, they're affiliated with the Art Institute or the school. Um, we've had a few students actually from the School of the Art Institute uh, work here with us as well. Um, so where those things make sense, I, I would say it can be a little tricky because time is limited and people are pulled in so many different directions. Um, but yeah, so we've, we've had some of that partnership. And our next question is from Coastal Carolina folks. They want to know how much you charge for materials for all the machines. So um, just philosophically, you know, when we have programs in the library for children, we don't charge them for the paper plates they're going to color and anything. So our classes are free and no charge. <clears throat> However, we have the open shop where people can make things. We decided early on that we would, we wanted a small charge in there for materials. And it was to get some skin in the game. We wanted people to um, before they have a job that they want to print, that they've worked on it to make sure it's the best that it can be before they try to print it. Um, <clears throat> so we have a very minimal amount that we charge, and it's more to make you like think about it. Because if it were free, um, for a while we had free computer printing, and the amount of waste we had every night was enormous. Enormous people, you know. So we wanted to avoid that. So. Um, we charge one dollar for 30 minutes of 3d printing yeah and because you can only print for up to two hours your print is not going to be more than four dollars um, and then for the laser cutter um, for the acrylic um, you can have up to a, um, a 25 square inch piece for a dollar usually and um, we have like our regular acrylic and then we have our premium acrylic, which is like mirrored or um, like frosted on one side. So that's, you know, $2 for the same amount. Um, and then that also allows us to have some usable scrap. So we have a free pile of scrap that if you can figure out what to do with it, there's no charge whatsoever. Um, we do not charge for time on the laser cutter, which is also a nice thing that we're happy to not have to do. Um, I know some universities do have to do that. Um, and then for the vinyl, it's like a sheet of, I think nine by 12, you can have for a dollar. Um, and so you don't need a library card to come in or use those things or make materials. We have guest passes that we can charge you with, um, just like we would for you know printing your boarding passes or something. And you can bring in some of your own materials. Mm -hmm. um, we've been around a while, so we, we know which materials you cannot use um, based like on the laser cutter because of the, the fumes they admit, maybe the smoke, maybe um, some of them have an oily resin that you know jams the laser. So we don't allow those, but we do allow some. The other thing I wanted to throw in that um, I'm ashamed and we're not going to show you is our storage room. You need more storage than you ever think, you know, and I have been pretty good in trying to scavenge every file cabinet, every bookshelf, bookcase that we can have to um, put in our, our little back room that we inherited. So if you're planning, you know, try to have more space than you realize for materials, excess equipment, um, other materials too. And the one thing we don't have in this space is a sink, which if you can get that incorporated in your space, that's great. Um, it helps you um, provide more classes, more art classes we could do. 
but also just, you know, washing up after something or, you know, yeah, after you use one of the, the laser cutters or something. Some nice uh, set from the laser cutter on your hands, et cetera, right? Yeah. Um, well, it's exactly noon here, my time, I'm in mountain time. So we're at an exact hour and um, I just wanna say thank you so much and then just check to see if there's any other additional questions from anyone in the group. Um, I would love to come visit. I feel this way after almost every time, but like I do a tour, but now I really wanna to go to Chicago. I lived in Chicago for a short period of time and I worked at the Savvy Traveler bookstore. I think I mentioned that to you yeah. last time we chatted, but like you're really making me miss Chicago right now. So um, thanks for showing us your space. And it, for anyone that is planning, if you look behind me and you see that there's stacks of things, literally like sewing machines and Mulsbot boxes, I have found that when you, when you, if you lose a box and you have to send it back for like repairs, they'll charge you for the box. I don't know if you all know that. So like Lulz bot 3D printer boxes are between 50 and a hundred dollars each. And so I just like, I stash them everywhere I possibly can. And, and it's so true. You need so much storage and you don't even realize like, oh yeah, I need to save boxes and I can't break them down because there's foam inside. Right. I don't know if you've all run into this, but anyway. Oh, yeah. You'll see if you don't if you don't see now you'll see it later. So there's a little tip for you all. But thank uh, you so much, Erica. Yeah, I'm just I'm gonna stay past my two o'clock time because I've got I think enough time to make coffee for this party we're having after. Um, I came from a public <laughs> library background. I now work in higher ed, so I had some more public library specific questions because you guys are the first. I think the first public library yes. that we've had on board. Yes. Um, one of the things that we, my previous position at DC Public Library, um, we had a lot of patrons uh, who came in partially because we were also the central library for accessibility services. So I was wondering if you had worked with any programming for uh, patrons who have, might have accessibility needs, whether that be deaf or hard of hearing or blind. Um, and then I had one other question and now of course it's escaping me. Oh, um, I thought of it. So you guys talked a little bit about outreach programming. Do you bring your 3D printers on the road? What do you do in terms of that to do further outreach um, in the city of Chicago or maybe beyond that? So for outreach, originally we had bought um, some really portable 3D printers, but unfortunately they use PLA. ABS. 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 Mm -hmm. And there was some um, concern about that, so we stopped using those. However, we do lug out our um, maker bots, take those on the road. We try to other to come up with other hands-on activities, um, which aren't necessarily 3D printing, but something that people can do while we talk to them. Uh, we recently made some um, linoleum stamps on the laser cutter that we kind of take out and we, it's kind of a make a bookmark activity, but also like you can make stamps at the library. Um, so that's one we've been using uh, quite a bit this year. Um, and then we have some smaller printers that we're getting that we would probably take out with us. Um, sometimes we'll pre-cut cards and stickers and let people kind of assemble their own at events. Um, so those are some of the things that we offer, little activities. Um, and then to the accessibility question, we're also in the central library. So um, those are services that, you know, are offered elsewhere. Um, but we, some of our staff have a, a partnership with um, an organization called Second Sight. And so uh, we've had a few private classes for them, um, mostly because if, nine as mark said earlier you know if you have a full group of people um then you can't also list that as a public workshop because then there's too many people so um we've hosted classes for them um and then this is uh july's diversibility month so we've got um some 3d printed um braille bead workshops on the calendar that we're going to be doing um and we also had um a group that was um they were blind and what what we did for them is um, we use the um, connect and we 3d scan them so that they had a, a, a 3d bust of themselves when they left we thought that was you know really poignant yeah and so this room is accessible um, and the 
counter height for the workstations may be a little bit high, um, but it's close. There's enough space to get to and from. So that was one of our when we planned to make sure it was wheelchair accessible mm -hmm. as a minimum. Yeah. And we've had um, we've had one or two patrons who had um, like motor skill, um, you know, who needed help with that. And so what we did in that is just um, assigned one of the staff persons to work with them because they didn't have um, the control of their their hands and arms. So um, we did accommodate for that. Cool. All right. So anyone else will ask one more time. Does anyone else have any questions? Doesn't seem like it. All right. <laughs> well, thank you guys so much again um, for being our first public library tour. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you for everyone who tuned in to the tour today. Um, it will be posted on YouTube, as I've said. Um, and we'll be hosting more throughout the summer. Stay tuned to the Google group where we post these. Um, do you guys, if you guys have anything else to say, and Amy, if you have anything yeah. else, I'll leave it to you. All of the past uh, virtual tours are on the website, and it seems like they've gotten hundreds of views. Um, I know I get a lot out of them. I know not everyone can participate in real time, but for those of you who are participating now, I'll chat the link so that you all can um, head over there and take a look. Okay, so everything that we do, it goes there. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.